worked effectively in Kashmir. Uh, the trainers and all are provided. And there are the, the kind of rapid uh, travels and trips that are made by a number of uh, US embassy officials, including the military attache to these conflict areas would suggest that they're working very closely and they're monitoring it and they're probably also pushing. In fact, if I, if I, uh, just to give you an anecdote, in 2006, when uh, the US ambassador, while visiting Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh state, uh, talked about how the Naxalite or the Maoist activities is, is, uh, is discouraging um, uh, foreign direct investment in this area and that the government bring, you know, urging the government to do something about it. Uh, there was within 24 hours, there was a response from the Indian side, from the, from the highest quarters of the Indian government, where, this, where they obviously, obliquely or directly referring with, with while, while ref, I mean, obliquely referring to the US, uh, uh, you know, diplomats, uh, uh, you know, urging, they, they said that the government of India is uh, engaged and is determined to, to oust them from this area. Uh, so I don't think telling them, I mean, obviously they know exactly what is happening. And I find it very difficult to believe that it's my job to go and tell the US government how bad Indian government is behaving. I mean, after what they're doing in Iraq, <laughs> Afghanistan, Vietnam, I mean, I would be, I, I would find it very difficult to convince myself that it serves any purpose. American people, yes. Just as I must address my own people. I must, yes. World people, yes, because we do want international, pe popular, uh, you know, public opinion to, to, to stand by the Indian people who are resisting neoliberal policies and neoliberal uh, aggression that is taking place in the country. As, actually, that is very, very important part of it. So that I consider my job. U.S. government, I mean, I don't talk to my government. Why the hell should I talk to the U.S. government? That's, that's my way of looking at it. I mean, no disrespect. I mean, this is something that, that is my... How did I enter? You know, in the worst situation, and the most repressive and oppressive conditions also, there are always avenues. You know, people are ingenious. They find their own ways in which, you know, they manage. So, I mean, Maoists were enterprising. They were able to uh, send us, uh, uh, you know, uh, exactly give us... Uh, 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 you know, uh, they guided they guided us into the into the territory. Told us how to do how to go about it, and uh, it is possible to do it because you can't deploy a, a, a policeman to watch over you. You know, every five feet. I mean, India is also a vast country, of course, one fifth the size of United States, but with uh, four times the population of the United States. So you can imagine, one can also get lost in the middle of a large crowd. So it's very easy to. To, uh, to to disappear so that's not a problem uh, that that uh, it's rather you know there are ways in which people move in and out and in fact uh, in February I was I revisited that area because we were part of a team which went to get five policemen who had been abducted by the cops uh, by the by the Maoist release so we entered that area again but this time with clear you know uh, approval of the authorities, and we met the very many of the same people that uh, we had met, uh, I had met in my last visit. So there are ways. At times, it's, uh, it's you know it's the state itself, the authorities themselves create the conditions where it becomes possible. Otherwise, there are ways and means in which you know uh, you can enter these areas, uh, visit and come out and report about it. And so far, nothing. I mean, nobody has stopped us from doing that. Mercifully. I was just wondering whether in the seven states that you're talking about in Central India, whether there's any mapping of the special interests that are taking over those areas through the special economic zones. Is there any mapping of that? Well? No, look, special economic zone is uh, slightly different than uh, the forest areas which are required for mining. Special economic zones are those where Indian laws do not apply, where tax has been waived for, for companies, which are deemed to be exporting, I mean the units, which either are manufacturing unit or service units, which export goods and services, okay? And for which tax 
laws and other normal provisions of law do not apply. Now that's a different thing, where again the peasant lands have been uh, taken over by special economic zones. Um, uh, this is a slightly different thing, where mining areas, uh, you know, forest areas, are being opened up for mining or being mining licenses are given to large conglomerates so that they can move in and, and clear the forest and start digging uh, the earth to, you know, mine uh, its resources that are there, uh, where special, which may need not be special economic zones. So there is a big difference between the two. But it's part of the same larger struggle, land-related. The, the next part of the question was, uh, the, the conglomerates that are going in, is there a mapping of which? which which are uh, this are is actually, are as I speak, you know, this is also very interesting. That's an interesting question. Uh, we have a right to information act in India, which means that anybody can file an application and get some information, which, which under the charter has been allowed where people can, I mean, citizens can access that information. So under right to information, when people try to get information about the memorandum of understanding side, signed by various state governments with the uh, with the mining corporation, they said no to it, citing commercial uh, secrecy mm -hmm. uh, and ne need. So they cited commercial secrecy need as the reason for not sharing that information about the details of agreement that the state governments have signed and what kind of concessions they are they are offering, what are the other things that they, they are pledging them, etc., etc. We didn't know. Now this information has been collected slowly and laboriously now, and that is in the process of being uh, collated and analyzed by groups uh, which are working in Bangalore. So we we should be be able to uh, get uh, information about. Uh, uh, precisely the kind of thing you are asking. Uh, as of now, we have only bits and pieces here and there. Uh, no detailed analysis has been. Has been. Um, I also wanted to thank you for the presentation, and I, I actually uh, did the homework and read the piece online before. And, and But the most interesting thing that, I mean, with, this is all hopefully solutions oriented. And the most interesting thing that you said today, I thought, was when you were in Bustar and, and the coalition on the ground of the resistance movement came from the far right and the far left and all, all over the map. And since, obviously, what, it, what we're going to have to create or have to envision in, in the course of the future is something that transcends all of our traditional political divides, which essentially linguistically divide us from reality and, and the effectiveness of our own, you know, revolutionary power. But in, so the question basically is, like in the U.S. we face the same thing. I mean, we have a thousand activist groups, and they're all focused to a large degree on the corporate oppression of the people. But these people are focused on food safety, and these people are focused on nuclear power, and these people are focused on the takeover of the schools, and these people are focused on, you know, trade issues. And they're all in separate foxholes, and somehow they become competitive entities rather than collaborative entities. And among all the different groups that, you, that are essentially facing the, the corporate takeover, I mean, one would like to envision a, a bridging of, of people's movement between people in America, like the Wisconsin laborers who are getting totally screwed out of their entire union history, and people in India who are basically getting screwed out of their land, because we have a, a huge displaced small farmer population here, as you probably know, is corporate farming took over the heartlands here and poisoned it. And similarly with Japan now, where you have corporate energy is essentially making the entire north part of the country uninhabitable. And there's people now finally rising up and, and just saying, we have allowed the, the, the corporations essentially to capture our regulatory agencies, coin-operate our politicians, and drive us all into a state of corporate servitude in different linguistic zones, <laughs> but it's all the same thing. So, from your experience in India, what do you see as possible in terms of building a new vocabulary, a new understanding that confronts this as a whole? Well, in a nutshell, I, I believe that we are far away from that. I wouldn't like to work. The point I was trying to make about Bastar was how lived experience of people, especially of those who are at the receiving end, has radicalize them and they have seen linkages which they earlier couldn't make. 
it's possible for them to see the linkages between their displacement, the attack by the state-led forces or the corporations which are backing them to, to grab the, the, the tribal land through hook or by crook. And in fact, the stories of, of how coercion and, and fraud has played such an important role in grabbing tribal land. All this has radicalized the way they see a connection between the state, the corporations, the land grab, and their own life experience, and their own assertion that they don't want to part with this land. So somewhere, this is their own life experience which has radicalized them. And of course, the presence of the Maoists does help, because the vocabulary is very different. What shape it will take, I don't know, because that's, we are still a long way from there. Uh, urban intellectuals uh, probably find it more difficult to work with each other because of the political and ideological differences than people mm -hmm. when they are forced by circumstances to come together. So, I mean, that is our own failing that we have to look into. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us can have reservations about A, B, C, D, but that doesn't matter. If we see it as part of an overall resistance, then it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who are willing to come together, Urban intellectuals find it very, very difficult, and they keep, don't go there, it's those people, bad people, you get contaminated. I mean, that untouchability, I think it's a civilizational, uh, probably a civilizational thing, you know, where it's untouchability is so much a part of us that we also practices where ideological, uh, you know, need to collaborate and cooperate with each other is concerned. So, that's it. Let's see how it unfolds. I mean, I would say, amen to what you said, you know, that I hope. We, uh, we reach there where we are able to overcome these differences and realize what we are into. A very small thing, for instance, I mean, why go so far? One of the things that the civil liberties movement in India is taking up in a big way, and it hasn't found its resonance in larger society, is that we are saying no to war against our people. We say it's only when the state stops fighting and waging war against our people that you can expect the people because people don't have propensity to pick up weapons and fight because they love violence. That does, that's not true in our understanding. We believe that the state has the greater responsibility and the larger responsibility of not waging war. If they stop, then there is a possibility for everybody, even who, those who have taken up arms for, to, be, to be persuaded to. Now, even that is something which is controversial in India right now. Now, one would have thought that this would at least, you know, after 63 years of relentless war that we have, that we have, we have seen take place in our own subcontinent, that there would be some resonance, you know, some reflection over uh, uh, how disastrous it is for us. Uh, it's not just a question of morally shaming or something, but it's actually a war where we are, we are you know, uh, committing self-goals every time. We are destroying ourselves in the process. We are weakening ourselves. So, yet, you don't find that. Uh, I hope that happens. But if we can't even come together on such a broad <coughs> issue, which is of so, uh, you know, a, a, such a deep concern for all of us, uh, I think it will take some time before we reach uh, where you want us to. Yeah. Um, actually, something that struck me while you were talking is that the usual, you know, the way the media tends to describe, you know, tribals within the central you know, corridor is that they have no sense of agency. And it's interesting to hear you say that there are some who are very much part and parcel of the movement, and then there are others who may affiliate themselves actually to the Indian state. I was wondering if A, you could just tell us a little bit about where that distinction lies. I mean, why is it that there are some who actually support? and are working with the Indian government and yeah. the military forces vis-a-vis -vis others who are part of the group. Yeah. And as a follow-up, I used to actually work with the Planning Commission, and recently there's the action plan that's been um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, designed to sort of ramp up development expenditures within that area. I was wondering what your thoughts were on this, because they stick to all this idea of you know, rural credit or you know, very deep, a very depoliticized discourse of development where yeah. you just throw money at you know, the people and then everything should become... Thank you for clear. posing these questions because this, actually this allows me to say something on this issue which is of great importance. Yes, uh, it's very interesting. When I said that you find tribals both amongst the Maoists, even amongst the Salvajudu, and who are not connected with each other, it's very interesting. The section of the population which I mean, both our studies as well as the studies of, uh, of the Ministry of Rural Development itself says 
in those many categoric terms that uh,